powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, this is Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. And of course, on a Monday, it's a Mosher Monday. Jeff Mosher's here for Football at Four. We look back at a very dominating Eagles win. And of course, Football at Four on this day, it is brought to you by Cape Regional Health System. For a healthier life, call 609-463. Kate, there is Jeff Mosher as we get ready for another edition of Football at Four. And Mosher, you know, there's not a lot to pick apart. The carcass is still laying out there, the New York football giants. But uh, when you look back at that game, 48-22, what stands out as some of the most impressive moments for you when you look back and say, see, this is why this Philadelphia team is being looked at as the best team in the league? Well, the Eagles got off the bus. That was good. <laughs> the Giants may not have. Uh, no, actually, I, th- I, think, um, I think the Giants, you know, th- there was no lack of effort there. there. I heard Carl Banks. Uh, someone told me Carl Banks, the great, you know, former Giant lineman and, um, and broadcaster, say after the game that there is not one single position, and not just offensive line, but literally, like left tackle, left guard, running back, safety, deep safety post, that the Giants have a better player than the Eagles at on the, on the football field. And I don't know if that's an arguable point, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I just think that the, the Eagles are clearly an, a, a superior team, a Super Bowl-ready team. The Giants are not. They, they started off well doing what they do best. They've had a lot of injuries that prohibit them from doing what they were doing earlier in the year. They may not win again another game. I don't know. I give credit to their coaching staff. But to answer your question about what they did, the Eagles, most impressively, I believe, is that they didn't just look at the chart and say the Giants have the worst, one of the worst rushing defenses in football. Let's go run at them. They said, let's go get our points really quickly through the air, where they all the Giants also have a very uh, beat-up pass defense. And then after we do that and get our lead through the air, like a lot of teams do, then we will punish them with the ground game. And I think you guys know whenever you're doing anything, whether you're building something that you bought at a store that needs to be assembled, like when the plan comes together as perfectly and efficiently as it has been for the last few games for the Eagles, it's just uh, something to really admire and behold. Yeah, I mean, I tweeted at at one point was this is a game you don't see this a lot in the NFL where the talent disparity was visible. A lot of times, you know, if there's two teams at talent, you know, you mask it, you do certain things. The Eagles took the talent disparity and ran with it. They just absolutely had yeah. more talent and showed it. They imposed their will against a team that didn't, like, not show up. They just weren't good enough. To, they just did not have the talent. And I think, I think that's one of the things that was impressive because, you know, we talked earlier, we kind of started the show with, Jalen Hurts is like Tim Duncan almost. Like, he's not flashy. He doesn't, like, pop off the page. Like, but at the end of the day, you're like, man, this guy has no turnovers, 202 touchdowns. You know, like, he just, like, professionally, like, surgically goes after you. It just takes care of business. And, you know, it was again yesterday where he didn't have these numbers that popped off the page, but somehow he popped off the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a really good way. To put it, we spent a lot of time talking about Jalen Hurts and breaking him down on the pregame show, and he is so fundamentally sound, as you were just referring to Tim Duncan, who was called the big fundamental, right? Right. He just did everything. And I thought that that was really illustrated early on uh, in this on the first drive that they scored the touchdown. It ended up with Miles Sanders three yard rushing touchdown. They were facing a third and long. And Martindale came after him with a blitz like he always does. And it was it's really an innocuous play now when you think about it. But he hit Devontae Smith on like a quick out to the right side. And Darnay Holmes had really good coverage. But so the ball had to be out immediately, had to be well placed, had to be to the outside shoulder of Devontae Smith. The protection had to be there to give him the, 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 the split second to do it. And he had to know that he had to get rid of the ball quickly in the face of the extra man pressure. And he did it, and it was a first down, and a few plays later, they're in the end zone. And that's sort of become symbolic of what they've been doing to teams for the last four, five, six, seven weeks. Jalen Hurts is um, top ten among quarterbacks who are blitzed, meaning they're, they're trying to blitz him. They know that they have to fa- force him off his spot. They're trying to get him to make mistakes. 
but he's not running against the blitz all the time. He is able, he and the offensive line are doing an excellent job of diagnosing them and knowing exactly where the voids will be uh, and where the ball is supposed to go. And if you go back to two weeks ago into Tennessee, the touchdown he threw to Devontae Smith was really a thing of beauty um, because Devontae Smith probably wasn't the original first read on that play. It was a, co- uh, a cover four concept with trips to the right, Devontae to the left. But when that happens and you know that when you have three receivers to the right, one of those safeties has to come rotate over there. And then the backside safety is one-on-one on the receiver on the X on the left side, which was Devontae. So immediately Devontae Smith, I mean, Jalen Hurts sees that and knows I have Devontae Smith against uh, a Titan safety who's going to be 10 yards down the field. And it, it, they just worked the route perfectly. He caught it right in front of the safety, eluded the contact, and went into the end zone for a touchdown. These are the kind of things where – these guys are making it look easy. It's not easy yeah. to play quarterback in the NFL. <laughs> They're making it look that way. It's it's almost it's boring. <laughs> it's boring, you know, to our example of Tim Duncan. It's it, Jalen Hurts has become the <laughs> most boring superstar in professional sports uh, along with this team. It's just they're they're dominant. Uh, and and they're not almost entertaining, which is fine. I'm not complaining about that, Mosh. But uh, no, it's, it's tough just, for our job, though. Like we sit here and just gush over everything, right? Everything, I know. Oh, it's great. It's great. <laughs> right. I, I like throw a pick, dude. You know, do something. <laughs> F- fumble the ball. All one, right? of, one of his three picks was tipped in the air this year. <laughs> can you just true? Can you let me complain? My goodness, I, know. I don't know what to do. And now they uh, fix the special teams for the most part. We can't yeah. even rip the coverage. And they ah, need a new tough. punter. <laughs> yeah, actually. Well, what's, what's, the funny part about that is the punting thing would have would have really stood out if not for the Giants punter who did the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in a game before and tried to punt the ball off. Off the turf, so I, <laughs> even that you can't can't be too hard on. <laughs> Real yeah. good. Although, guys, I mean, I guess if we're nitpicking and looking for things, they're going to need a new holder. <laughs> I, I I mean, it seemed like uh, Britain Covey did a pretty good job of it. I mean, they'll obviously bring in a punter, uh, and that punter will probably have good holding experience. So, we'll, I don't think the <laughs> Britain Covey holding thing will last very long. Is Coy Detmer available? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh. It's things are going not too well. Things are going very well. But it, something from yesterday, like an image and a clip, is uh, A.J. Brown and a bunch of the guys laughing, joking it up, having a good time on the sideline. And Jalen Hurts is like angry face, stoic, doesn't give yeah. a bleep. Uh, and that, that shows me a lot because that's how this team is going about each and every game, and I imagine that's how they're going about each and every day in practice leading up to game day on Sunday. So I guess just speak to the work that they're putting in and Jalen Hurts as a leader because it's not, to your point a few minutes ago, Moshe, it's not as easy as it looks, and I just think it's impressive with how Jalen Hurts has led this team and the work ethic he has. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think a lot of it starts with Jalen himself, Um, You've heard the stories about pop quizzes in the hallways, about the composure and the leadership. I think a lot of it is being the son of a coach. I think a lot of it is going to Alabama. I think a lot of it is having endured what he did at Alabama and did not bury his head. He competed for the job when he didn't get it, went to Oklahoma, continued to thrive there. Must be nice to have played. I mean, sometimes it's a knock to consider you didn't make it at Alabama, but it sure must have been nice to be coached by both Nick Saban and Lincoln Riley, especially when you're a quarterback. Then you come to the NFL. Uh, you don't have to start immediately. You know, obviously it was a terrible situation his rookie year with everything going on with, with the Eagles at the time, but that also did impact him. And I think that that image you're referring to, now we have no idea what's going through his mind. And it sort of looks like he's mad. I doubt he's mad, right? He yeah. might just be like thinking about beating on the, uh, the Bears next week or something like that. But the image shows he is has a seriousness about him and a leadership element. I think what really stands out about the image, Ryan, is that the two guys next to him are hooping. They're not afraid. It's not like they think that they have to be serious just like he is. They yeah. respect him, but they also have their fun as well. And mm-hmm. right now when you're winning, you know, we saw it with the Phillies. You know, you just it brings the team together in a way that you can never expect when, when the season begins. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's impressive right now. You you brought up the blitzing element of the Giants and Martindale and the Giants defense uh, have the had the highest blitz percentage in the entire NFL over 40 percent of the time. I think it was going into the game yesterday. Mm-hmm. And that was one element 
that was being talked a lot of, uh, about throughout the, you know, throughout the Delaware Valley is, well, how is he going to handle uh, you know, a defense that is really attacking him like the Giants? He handled it almost uh, you know, to perfection. So are we concerned about that at all? Like, Is there anything or any team or potential matchup that we can say, all right, well, he's handled everything perfectly, but this defense could be an issue or whatever it may look like? No, I mean, the only thing I think is fair to say is that they're kind of going through a streak now of playing teams that aren't very good at either. They're, they're either not very good offensively or they don't have good quarterbacks or they've got severe limitations. And then obviously when you get to the playoffs, that changes. You think about the 2017 team, they went through a streak there right around week 10 to 15 where they were just smashing teams like the Eagles are doing now. It was Denver, it was Chicago, it was Washington. They were putting up 30 points or putting up 40 points and making the game look easy. Then you fast forward to the playoffs, and I get it. They, they didn't have Carson. But, I mean, they came within the skin of their teeth of beating the Atlanta Falcons or a drop by Julio Jones there. Um, and then, obviously, after a very good championship game, they, they had to hold on to beat the New England Patriots. So when you get to the playoffs, you're going to face better offenses. You're going to face better schemes. You're going to face better defenses. And – it's not going to seemingly be the cakewalk that it's looked like. But but to, to get there, you've got to be able to do this and show what you're worth. And I think the Eagles have more wins against current playoff teams than any other NFL team right now. So even the, the quote-unquote weakness of their schedule really isn't much of an argument against them. I uh, are talking with Jeff Mosher, football at four, of course, inside the Birds podcast. Uh, and I know that you guys talked a lot about Hurts, the MVP. We were talking a little bit about – I guess this notion of like, you know, hey, you take Ty, Ty Hill off of Kansas City and Mahomes is still putting up these numbers. Is Hurts one of these guys that if he didn't have A.J. Brown and just had the same similar guys that he had last year, are we still talking about him as this difference making player or is he a product? Because Dan Orlovsky had said something about like, hey, this is the easiest offense to play in. And this mm-hmm. isn't a knock on Hurts. He said it earlier in the season. He's now brought it back up that they have the best offensive line. They have a number one wide receiver. They have the best running game in the league. Their defense constantly gives them the ball. They get turnovers. Is he a byproduct of that, or is he good enough that he did, does it need, much like Mahomes, he doesn't need Tyreek Hill. He's still an MVP. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, all right. So I, I, I have a couple of different responses for that. First, he, there is no question in my mind, that he is surrounded by the best all-around cast in the game when you include offensive line, tight ends. And by the way, he's doing this without Dallas Goddard, which is amazing, uh, and wide receivers. I mean, there are teams that have just as good maybe one and two wide receivers, but I don't know about any team that has as much offensive support as Jalen Hurts. And then there's no question that Tyreek Hill was a loss for Patrick Mahomes. We can't answer until it happens what Jalen Hurts will look like when he doesn't have all this around him, but we do know that's going to happen someday. It's going to be impossible to keep this level of 53 around him every single year. This is Howie Roseman's tour de force. Even Howie probably understands that, he, you know, a couple of the moves he made, not going to just, not going to have five guys in labor contract disputes and be able to get them all like he did with CJ and AJ Brown and whoever else he's brought in that I'm not thinking of. But at the same time, Mike. James Bradbury. Yeah, James Bradbury, right, right. At the same time, I mean, Patrick Mahomes is playing with, maybe the great, one of the greatest tight ends to ever play the game, a surefire Hall of Famer. He is playing with a really good offensive line himself. He is playing with a head coach who is known as one of the greatest schemers of all time. So I'm not taking away from Patrick Holmes. My, my point is I get that Patrick Holmes has lost and Jalen Hurts has gained. And so if your argument is maybe that's why Mahomes deserves MVP, fine. I'm not, it's a subject word. Who cares, right? But I usually to me, in my mind, the MVP goes to the guy who's not necessarily the best but has had the best season. And I don't think you can I don't think you can say anybody is having a better season than Jalen Hurts all around. Is this this is uh, you know a, a question that's not black and white here, but you, you bring up what Howie has been able to do and the roster that Jalen Hurts has and this Eagles team, what it looks like. This is like the beginning of an era, especially for Jalen Hurts and this team. This may be the best chance they have at a Super Bowl, which is just weird to say. And I think that causes the fans 
a lot of fans are waiting for the other shoe to drop. We were just asking four or five months ago, can this guy even be a starter in the, in the league? And now this team's 12-1. and one. They're making everything look easy. Is this their best chance at a Super Bowl, really at the start of the Jalen Hurts era? All I can say is I think this is their best 53 that I've ever seen them put together. I think this is a better 53 than the 2017 team. I think it's a better 53 than the 2004 team. I mean, the 2017 team had Steph Wisniewski at left guard and Halapuluti Vaitai at left tackle for almost most of the year. Um, they had Ronald Darby miss 10 weeks and have to sub in guys like uh, Jalen Watkins and Rasul Douglas and Patrick Robinson a little bit on the outside before he moved to the slot. I, they had their linebackers after Jordan Hicks got hurt were like Michael Kendricks and uh, – Who's the guy they signed from the Ravens off the street? Donnell Ellerby, remember him? They signed yep. him like two weeks, and he started in the NFC uh, divisional game against the Falcons. This <laughs> Eagles team right now is getting just as good as quarterback play as it got from Carson Wentz, and it's got a better running game, a better offensive line, probably maybe a wash on the D line, maybe not. I don't know, it could be either way; it's close. Better at linebacker, better at corner, maybe a wash at safety because Malcolm was so good with with Rodney there, but like, it's hard to argue that this is not the best 53 we've seen in God knows how long. Maybe ever Eagles history. Yeah, maybe. Well, maybe. And I think though, what your question is fair is that much like the team that won the Super Bowl a couple of years ago, there was a lot of one year deals that the onus was, Hey, if these guys work out, it's going to be great. But then the problem is then you have to make a lot of decisions. So if you don't get the job done this year, you're going to have a different looking team most likely next year. I mean, you got a lot of decisions. Chauncey Gardner Johnson, James Bradbury, TJ Edwards, Kaiser White, Fletcher Cox, Javon Hargrave, Brandon Graham, right? He's not back next year. Uh, no, I think he is under contract, but yeah. Does he have another year, Graham? Uh, they gave him like a million revisions to his. I'm sure he's got voidable years. No, I think he still has actually one Okay. Left, but... Well, I mean, you catch the drift here. A lot of defense right now on that side of the ball are unsigned players that you're thriving. So it's like, is the pressure on this team? Did they know, like, hey, this yeah. is the only shot we got with what you're saying is the best roster maybe we've ever had? Yes, from it's going to be hard to keep everybody, but it's not. It's actually, I think a lot of people are saying it's going to be so difficult to keep this team together or a good part of it together for next year because of the money they're going to have to pay Jalen Hurts. But I don't want to get too deep into it now. A lot of this is yeah. contract language, but there's a huge advantage to having a second, third, or anybody not drafted in the first round as your quarterback and that fourth year. Jalen Hurts is still only supposed to make like $1.8 million next year. So what the Eagles can do, Seattle did this with Russell Wilson uh, also, and that's the, the advantage I'm talking about, is they will give him a new contract and a ton of money, but they'll take a big chunk of that, say $30 million, $25 million, right, of the new money that you're supposed to get guaranteed, and they'll put it in next year's $1.8, whatever he's supposed to make. So now he's making $27 million, right, that, just for that year. He's already collected the $150, $200 million paycheck from the bonus, but for bookkeeping purposes – they don't really start the extension in, until 2024. Okay, so in 2023, they take $25 million of that new money, put it in a salary. Now he's making $26, $27, 8000000 million like that. That's still a bonus, right? I mean, mm-hmm. that's still like half of what a guy like Rodgers is going to make or Dak Prescott or Deshaun Watson. So it, it's not impossible for them to bring back a bunch of guys that we're going to be talking about. It might have to be short-term. They're going to have to get all that money in – in the first two years, and and they will have to obviously be competitive with teams trying to poach them. But I think that because the luxury of getting this guy in the second round or lower is that you're not heaping money on top of big money already, and you're going to save what you ordinarily would have if he was a first-round pick. Uh, Jeff Mosher, football at four. Of course, Eagles win 48-22. And, and, you know, realistically, you know, it was an interesting day. Obviously, everybody's looking at what Dallas did, uh, you know, just getting by – Houston at home, and then there's San Francisco and what they did. I feel like what they did should be more of the conversation, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Brock Purdy is still the quarterback there. I think he's going to have to show more. I know he beat Tom Brady and everything yesterday, but uh, for your money right now, is San Francisco the bigger threat or is it Dallas? (sighs) That's a great question. It's a big sigh. I think San Francisco. Uh, no, no. I think Dallas, obviously, because Brock, um, and even though he's played well, 
but both of them it, are very similar. I think that those two types of teams, and I'm not saying that they would beat the you are likely. I'm just saying I think to beat the Eagles, I think you have to work backward. You have to be able to come out and run the ball out of a passing look, like 11 personnel, three wide receivers, one, one tight end. Um, you have to be able to do that because you want the Eagles to be in their four-man fronts, and that's where you can run more effectively against them. And then if you're doing that, then you want to be able to come out in like two tight ends, two receivers, like make it look like you're going to run and then work play action pass off of that. Um, so while you have the Eagles in their five man fronts thinking run, then you're throwing the ball to your tight ends and in the in the voids of their zones. So we've seen some teams have success with that within games, but not for a full game. But I do think San Francisco and Dallas both are better than that than even Buffalo and Kansas City might be. So they're their biggest obstacles might come from the NFC from a schematic standpoint where their biggest obstacles would come from the AFC just from like, can this, is this quarterback just going to you know, play like the way Mahomes and Allen did last year and, and just figure out ways to score 35, 40 points on you. Is Nick Sirianni the coach of the year? We can talk a lot about Jalen Hurts MVP debate. That's the fun conversation and debate. Is it clear that Nick Sirianni is the coach of the year? I know that award is voted on a little bit differently an MVP, it's not always just best record, here's the trophy. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it'll probably be in his favor that Pete Carroll's won a few already, I think. So, um, but 16, and if he goes 16 and one, how do you not give him the coach of the year award? I mean, it's not well, like we, he's a we proven, were talking, you know, and, and then plus people will look at last year and say he, he might have deserved it last year or now, now we'll give it to him this year. Yeah, no, sorry to jump in there, but we were talking earlier, Moshe, about how. You know, the Eagles, they might not have a meaningful game for two straight weeks to end the regular season. The Saints game could be meaningless. The Giants game could be meaningless. So that could impact, you know, a variety of things, including Coach of the Year. Yeah, I'm just trying to think who else would really be, you know, if the Jets make the playoffs, maybe Roberts, especially with Mike, Mike White. But I, I just don't think that – Dan. Campbell. I don't think there's somebody who's been that impressive that, that they're really going to I think be, the hard part is with like, Sirianni – most see if you agree or, or if can can really extrapolate on this which is most times the head coach there is something he's known for calling the plays or he's a defensive mind Sirianni doesn't call the plays he's not a defensive mind it, it, so it's hard to quantify what his role is in the success of this team if he's not the offensive play caller or the guy who designs the defense Right. No, nah, th- th- there might be some so – that would be sort of the overthinking of why not to give it to him. I mean, he still presides over everything that goes on with the team. And, you know, it's not like they're a offensive-heavy team or a defensive-heavy team. They're about as balanced as it gets. So that, that whole CEO thing, sometimes that can help you. I mean, Pete yeah. Carroll is, is heavily involved in the game plan, and, and so is Nick Sirianni, by the way. I mean, he's heavily involved in how the game is going to look week to week. And I think most people who cover the league know that even CEO head coaches do that stuff Monday through Saturday. It's not like that they're just going around and patting guys on the ass all the time and saying good job or bad job. <laughs> you can't uh, underrate that, though. No, that's a big part of the job. <laughs> yes. uh, Jeff Mosher, check out the Inside the Birds podcast as they pontificate a lot more on the 48-22 win over the New York football Giants. The Eagles, of course, uh, improved at 12-1. and They will play Chicago next week. They are a 9 point favorite against the Bears, who at Justin Fields is going to be an interesting matchup for John Gaddon's defense. We'll see how that all goes down uh, the rest of the week here on Football at Four as Mosh is back on Wednesday's show. Mosh, we'll talk to you then, bud. See you guys. Uh, that's Jeff Mosher here from uh, InsideTheBirds.com and the Inside the Birds podcast. <laughs> 